Thank you very much for these kind words. Uh, Pro-Rector Professor Kremers, um, Dean Professor Steele, um, Vice-Rector Jakob Rühne, um, Zef Borcher, Professor von Ginkel, um, Joachim von Braun, thank you very much for these kind words. Um, fellow Director Sora Gerke, uh, Dr. Laurent Sedogo, Dr. Bubakar Barry from Waskal, um, colleagues, friends, uh, ladies and gentlemen, all protocols observed. This I learned in, <laughs> in Kenya. Um, let me go. It's a great pleasure being with you. And um, yeah, it's a great pleasure having the, the opportunity to talk a little bit about what I call little enemies and unhealthy outcomes. Um, I want to give you a little outline of what I want to talk about. I'll start with a couple of slides on the, on the let's say, the theoretical background or the framework of my talk. And then uh, I want to focus on three case studies. Um, Professor Van Ginkel <coughs> already mentioned my interest in this nexus between uh, agriculture and human health. And this is, in a way, reflected here in the <coughs> choice of these uh, three case studies, I want to talk a little bit about um, agriculture, oh, sorry, about malaria and climate change, um, about the, the Nipah virus outbreak in Malaysia in the late 1990s, a bit about coffee and the future of coffee in East Africa, and then finish this with some three concluding remarks or take-home messages. Professor Van Ginkel already mentioned global environmental change. I don't think that I need to dwell into this more, uh, 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 that what global environmental change and as part of this climate change is reality. However, up to relatively recently, uh, policymakers, the general public, and to a certain extent also the scientific community were very much focused on, let's call it more the macro effects of this. Uh, I'm thinking about extreme weather events, uh, uh, flooding, um, disappearance of, of major, if you want, symbol species like the polar bear. Yet, there is an increasing awareness that uh, GECs uh, have a pretty complex nature. And this complexity uh, of global <coughs> environmental change very often prevents a, a proper quantification of the outcome. Now, um, Myers and Patz developed um, this theory of insulating layers that very often prevent the measurability of effects of climate change and uh, changes in land use cover through their effects on deterioration of ecosystem services on health outcomes. Um, I would like to zoom a little bit more on this. Uh, there are several layers, if you want, several levels of these insulating layers. Let's start with um, the, simply the, the population uh, not yet approaching a vulnerability threshold when it comes to resource constraints. Another level would be that populations actually have the ability, if you want, to pay themselves out of their constraints. Um, uh, take the example of um, a water-constrained country or society like Israel that massively imports water through grain. Now, Israel is in the position, economically speaking, to do so. A similarly water-constrained country like Yemen is not. Populations are protected from environmental <coughs> change through infrastructure or technology as another insulating level. Think about uh, the loss of um, wetlands, the loss of water filtration, that communities that live downstream then can pay their way off through installation of water filtration systems. Change of behavior uh, and learning cultural uh, changes that lead communities to be less, less susceptible to uh, global environmental change uh, outcomes. I'm thinking about using protective clothing in the, uh, in the face of emerging infectious diseases. 
This will reduce the vulnerability, or at least will shelter communities from, uh, from the outcomes of global environmental change. And last not, but not least, philanthropy. Uh, having lived in Africa for the last uh, close to 10 years, I know how much <coughs> philanthropy uh, has an effect, especially when it comes to provision of medical services, free drugs, um, insecticide-treated bed nets, uh, societies that can afford indoor residual strength. All these elements provide insulating layers that make the measuring of negative health outcomes that are fueled by global environmental change and changes in land use very difficult. The rule of thumb, though, is the more vulnerable a population is, the less insulating layers they have and the more severe the GEC outcome will be. I mentioned pro uh, complexity. There is another element to think about, that the complexity is actually more pronounced when it comes to networks of biotic interaction. And biotic interactions could be predation, parasitism, disease transmission. This complexity or the outcomes are more than you look at an individual organism, like a crop plant. Now what you see here, this pretty confusing diagram, comes from a meta-analysis that Tuviakis et al. conducted using 688 individual studies that looked at the outcome of five different uh, GSC drivers, be it CO2 enrichment, end deposition, climate change, Arctic invasion, and land use change. And they were looking at the effects of trophic webs, of the effects of these five GEC drivers on trophic webs. And trophic webs could be plant-plant interactions, plant-herbivore, plant-pathogen, uh, herbivore pathogen, uh, uh, plant-animal as well as animal-animal, and above-ground and uh, below-ground interaction. And um, what, they f what they clearly came up with is, is that you have a cascading effect of changes on higher trophic levels down to lower traffic levels, trophic levels. And in other words, what we should be really concerned about are the impacts of GEC on the higher trophic levels and their effect down on the lower. As the proverb says, there is no enemy little. So let me start with my first case study of malaria and climate change. The resurgence of in, in infectious diseases is probably among the most hotly debated and widely discussed GEC outcomes. And malaria here has a very prominent role because it's, in terms of mortality, clearly the most important uh, infectious disease. We have about a million and a half, latest estimates about a million and a half deaths annually and primarily children under five and pregnant women, and primarily in sub-Saharan Africa. Now, IPCC is forecasting a, a significant longitudinal and altitudinal expansion of emerging infection, of in infectious diseases, and in particular, malaria. And one case in time, or one, one study that has been widely discussed, uh, were the, the, um, the outbreaks of malaria in the highlands of East Africa in the late 1990s. And this spurred a very controversial debate about the causes for these unprecedented outbreaks. I should maybe say a, a couple of explaining words for the ones that are not really experts on malaria. Um, malaria is a child killer. And um, if you grow up in a malaria hollow endemic region as a child, you certainly will get exposed to malaria multiple times during your infancy. Now, if you survive, you will build up a certain level of, if you want, acquired, not resistance, but acquired tolerance. So if you get infected later in your life, usually malaria um, events are less mortal are less mortal. And I'm talking primarily here about falciparum malaria. <laughs> However, if malaria reaches new regions, and 
case here is the highlands of East Africa where malaria was not present before. By definition, the population didn't grow up under an environment of disease pressure. And that's why you have in such new outbreak regions very high mortalities in very unusual demographic groups. We're talking about adults. Under normal circumstances, say in a horror endemic region, adult mortality in, uh, of, in, uh, as a result of a malaria infection is usually restricted to people with a deprived immune system, very often HIV uh, infected people and other people that suffer. Having said so, one of the cases that was de debated most is related to this very beautiful area in Western Kenya. This is the Brook Bonds tea plantation in Kuricho. Joachim knows this region very well. It's one of the most spectacularly beautiful parts of Kenya. And Kiricho gold is a delicious tea. My wife is addicted to it. Since we lived in Kenya, she is virtually traveling nowhere without a supply of Kiricho gold. Now, it's not the only delicious tea that they're producing in Kiricho. It's I think it's probably the continent's biggest tea plantation. About 50,000 people live there. And it's a very old plantation. I think it dates back to the early 1920s. And the owners of what, Brook Bonds, the owners of the Kiricho tea plantation, have kept meticulous records basically since the beginning of the operations there when it comes to health stats of their employees as well as the metrological data. So this plantation offers a treasure chest in time and space when it comes to metrological data as well as when it comes to, to um, uh, health data. Now, Shanks et al. in a paper in Emerging Infectious Disease 2002 used this data set from the Kiricho tea plantation um, from 96 to 95 and analyzed the relationships between uh, malaria incidence in hospital admission and temperature and rainfall and couldn't find any relationship. This was part, as part of the, the ongoing malaria atlas uh, project. Now, more recently, Pasquale revisited this, this case, looked at a different data set uh, using temperature from the Climate Research Unit in Norwich um, and using a larger data set dating from 1950 to 2002 and looked at the relationships of temperature in Kuricho, as well as in Kubale in Uganda, and two places in Rwanda and Burundi. And they could link increases, significant increases in temperature over time with an increase in malaria incidence. So where does this leave us? Now, Shang et al. attribute the undisputed spur in, in in mortality uh, uh, due to malaria during this period in the 1990s, primarily to sorry, primarily to the breakdown of chloroquine. Chloroquine at that time was an incredibly effective drug against falciparum malaria, and we lost this drug in the 1990s. Uh, widespread resistance. Um, uh, in falciparum populations, including in East Africa, became very common, and the drug is no longer useful. So Shanks attribute this outbreak uh, uh, of malaria in the highlands not so much to temperature factors, but to a breakdown in, um, in, of chloroquine, whereas Pasquale does not rule out, as Pasquale et al. does not rule out the temperature-driven factors that affect the development both of the vector population as well as the pathogen played a role in these epidemics. Now, more recently, again, people from Geffen et al. from the Malaria Atlas project did a remarkable study analyzing 100 years of data of falciparum. Again, for the ones that are not uh, too familiar with malaria, Plasmodium falciparum is the lethal malaria pathogen the ones that, well, causes a lot of death. Uh, so uh, getting it out, we're looking at um, uh, 100 years of 
falciparum data mm -hmm. um, by comparing the situation uh, of malaria uh, and the mystery of malaria at the turn of the last century, around 1900, with the situation in 2007, and computed the difference. Now, you have to keep in mind that during the last 100 years, we saw an unprecedented rise in temperature. So these changes happened in, an, in a significantly warming global environment. Now, what did they find? They found a significant disappearance of malaria from many, falciparum malaria, from many regions in the world. Um, just look at South, um, South America, Brazil in particular, look at Central Asia, and look at East Africa, uh, and Southeast Asia. And the, the figures that you see here, the color coding is, the more change, the more loss of malaria, the darker blue, the color. So what we actually see over, what we have seen over the last 100 years is a dramatic reduction in the endemicity of malaria across the globe, despite the fact that our globe has warmed significantly. Now, Gething attributes this, among others, to much greater efforts um, when it comes to control of the disease and control of the vectors. Uh, they attribute it to environmental management. Uh, they attribute it to, to basically the development of economies, the development of many economies. And they think that these factors were much more important and actually overruled, in a way, the, the temperature factors, the undisputed, again, factors of rising temperatures on certain biological parameters of the vector, as well as the pathogen. And finally, these authors conclude that the success or failure of our efforts, our global efforts to control, maybe even to eradicate falciparum malaria, will be substantially will be substantially more affected by control efforts than by climate change. Now, this has in a way a caveat. If we look at the, the reasons for the, the successes we have achieved in falciparum malaria control over the last 15 years, you can reduce them basically to two elements. First and foremost is atomazine-based co-therapy. Highly efficient, highly efficient anti-malarial drugs that are nowadays uh, freely available or at least to highly subsidized rate as, as first-line defense drugs. And second, the availability of synthetic pyrethroids, especially delta metrin and permethrin, as part of um, indoor residual spraying and especially as the treatment for long-lasting insecticide-treated nets, so IRS and LLIS. These are the two columns on which present uh, very efficient anti-malaria campaigns, uh, especially in sub-Saharan Africa, rely. Now, <coughs> we are in a situation where we're about to lose these two vital and essential elements of our anti-malaria campaigns. First and foremost, um, there, there are increasing reports about treatment failure with atomazine-based drugs coming from the Golden Triangle area of Southeast Asia, and that's the hotbed of uh, uh, drug resistance development uh, in, in, in falciparum malaria. Chloroquine resistant, resistance developed there, and uh, usually it takes about four to five years until these resistance strains end up in Africa. So, Usually from a record of a breakdown of an anti-malaria drug in Southeast Asia to treatment failure in Africa, it's a period of four or five years. So this is already a threat that we might lose artemisine as our first line drug, a first line defense drug. And there's nothing on the horizon that would replace artemisine based co-therapy quickly. The second threat is pyrethroid resistance. Uh, pyrethroids have been around for about 50 years, and there's increasing levels of pyrethroid resistance in anopheles populations, anopheles being the prime vectors 
of falciparum malaria in tropical Africa. And again, there is no other insecticide that we could switch to. There are no insecticides, public health suitable insecticides on the horizon that might replace um, pyrethras. And there is another threat that comes on top, and that's where we and my colleagues worked on. We looked at the population composition um, in various cities around the Kenyan coast over the last 20 years. Um, the, the prime vector of malaria in sub-Saharan Africa is Anopheles gambiae. And Anopheles gambiae is a bit complicated, it's a species complex. Anopheles gambiae SS, sensu stricto, is the prime vector of malaria in tropical Africa. And all the control efforts that I've mentioned, indoor residual spraying and insecticide treated nets, focus on malaria that is transmitted within the dwellings, indoors. And that's where Gambia SS feeds. What we observed is that over the last 20 years, there's been a dramatic decline in Gambia SS, the home dwelling mosquitoes, and a dramatic increase of Arabiensis and Meros, which are outdoor biting mosquitoes. So you have to think that presently, um, the prime vectors of malaria attack you, say, post 11 p.m., and it attacks you in your bedroom. If you're under an insecticide-treated net and your walls have been treated with a long-lasting pyrethroid, you are pretty safe. Now, if you do this over 20 years, the ones that accompany you in your bedroom get hammered, and they disappear, and that's what we are observing. So the prime vector that used to bother you in your bedroom has disappeared. And another group is taking over that bites you during the course of the day while you're in the field. Sounds trivial, but the problem is we have no control strategies at hand that would deal with the mosquitoes that will bite you once you leave your house. So there is a fair chance that in future, People in the tropics, in tropical Africa, will see malaria outdoors during the course of the day. And this is a real threat to the present control strategies uh, and threatens uh, the current levels of success in terms of uh, reducing malaria. Let me come to the second case study. This is um, on Nipah virus and the environment. Um, Nipah virus is a uh, paramyoxis virus which causes uh, acute uh, respiratory syndromes and especially fatal encephalitis in humans as well as in some domestic animals, in particular pigs. Now, there was a, um, a very spectacular outbreak for the first time of this disease in Malaysia in the late 1990s, causing about 250 cases of uh, human uh, encephalitis <coughs> as well as um, led to a, a, a phenomenally big culling of pigs. Now, NIF is maintained by these incredibly beautiful fruit bats of the, the genus Proctus. Uh, very often they are referred to as, as flying foxes. Um, and the transmission is through saliva, urine, feces of these bats, as well as through discarded fruits. Now, the distribution range of Nipah, of Nipah virus, is largely defined by the distribution range of these flying foxes. Coming back to the, and it, sorry, and in more recent, uh, more recent outbreaks, uh, following the, the first one in Malaysia, in um, Bangladesh and in India, actually no intermediate host, meaning no pigs, as in the case of Malaysia, were involved. So it seems that humans picked up the virus directly from contaminated uh, food, I think probably dates, and um, some people even 
uh, speculate about the possibility of human to human, uh, so direct transmission of this virus, making it a potentially incredibly dangerous zoonotic disease. Now, the, the 1997 outbreak in Malaysia um, was accompanied by a, a very, if you want, very spectacular hypothesis. Um, this coincided um, uh, with a, a, a very significant Enso-driven drought, which then resulted in large-scale forest fires, particularly on Sumatra and Borneo. And the, the, the theory was, the hypothesis was that the haze that was created by these fires led to, if you want, a mass emigration of flying foxes populations, especially from Sumatra over the Strait of Malacca into Malaysia. And that's how the virus, that's how the Nipah virus was introduced into Malaysia. Now, you can imagine that such a hypothesis um, gained a lot of public interest. Now, more recently, Pulliam et al. in a, in a um, Royal Society interface uh, paper did a meticulous <coughs> detective-like story <coughs> and analyzing, reanalyzing, revisiting this outbreak and came up with, if you want, a far more mundane <coughs> explanation. First and foremost, with serological and modeling efforts, they could clearly prove that the virus was already <coughs> in flying foxes populations in Malaysia predating the Nipah outbreak of 1997. In addition, their, their evidence was suggesting that actually agricultural intensification in Malaysia in the 70s, 80s, and 90s led to an increased encroachment uh, of agricultural productivity zones into forest areas, which then resulted in more bat pig and bat pig human contacts, and which led to an, a repeated priming of pig populations with the Nipah virus. And what they found out was the most important explanatory variable for this outbreak was simply the proximity of mango trees to piggeries. The proximity of mango trees to piggeries and very simple public health or policy regulations which enforced buffer zones when it came to mango production and, and pig production uh, completely eliminated. Uh, the, the problem of Nipah from Malaysia as we speak. Let me come to the last example, uh, or the last case study, coffee. And in particular here, the future of coffee in East Africa. Um, the coffee lovers will, 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 will be happy to, to learn that it's actually the most valuable uh, agricultural commodity uh, we know. It's about nine bill 90 billion uh, US a year. I think it's only beaten by, by petrol. Petroleum has a, has a higher uh, value overall. Now, the coffee berry borer, this tiny little cuculionic here, is the biggest constraint, the biggest biotic constraint for coffee production worldwide. It's more or less has reached all coffee production zones in the world and causes losses to the tune of approximately half a billion US a year. In, in a study that we published in, in, in 2009, we first looked at, we first modeled the, the, the thermal, the thermal um, uh, tolerance of CBB and came up with a model which forecasted a significant increase of generations of CBB with a temperature increase of one to two degrees Celsius and altitudinal as well as latitudinal shifts in the distribution of the pest once the temperature increases beyond two degrees, as you can see here, latitudinal as well as altitudinal. So uh, simply put, you have to move up your plantations the hill. Now, we used this biological model and took it together with climate data in order to develop predictions for East Africa's coffee production in 2050. And we had, if you want, three major findings. First of all, the, this 
prediction indicated that Arabica, which is the more valuable highland type of coffee, would disappear from any production zones that are below 1,200 meters in altitude. The present prime production zones of 13 to 1,800 meters of altitude in East Africa would face serious coffee berry boron outbreaks and would lead to an enormous constrained production in this area. And in order to be safe, Arabica would need to be moved, Arabica plantations would need to be moved beyond 1,800 meters in altitude. And we also looked at the availability of growing areas of 1,800 meters and above in East Africa, and they're not that many. So, grosso modo, we forecasted that under a, a, a climate change 2050 environment, we would see a significant reduction, temperature driven and CBB pest driven reduction of coffee production in East Africa, and even more so for the lowland coffee, Robusta. Now, from this, if you want, mapping exercise, we zoomed in. We wanted to look at one particular production zone. And if you want, similar as the Caricho tea plantation um, uh, um, exercise or story that I told you before, here we, we looked at the production around Kiambu in, in the central province of Kenya, which is one of the, the oldest coffee production zones in, in Kenya, where coffee production goes back to the beginning of the 20th century. And what we found out by comparing, um, no, let me go one, one step back. One thing that made this zone, again, the parallel is, is, is with the, the Kiricho tea plantation. What made this zone so very special is we had access to metrological data from the turn of the 19th to the 20th century up to now. Now, anybody who has worked in Africa knows how, and I'm talking about very precise metrological data, continuous metrological data. Anybody who has worked in Africa knows how rare it is to find such very long lasting precise uh, data sets on, on temperature and on metrological factors. So what did we observe? First of all, a dramatic change in demography. If you just look at the the, 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 the changes from 1969 to 2011, uh, population in Kiambu increased from 196 to 638 people per square kilometer. Kiambu, which used to be a rural district in, in the central province of Kenya, has basically been swallowed by Nairobi. It's part of the greater Nairobi uh, area nowadays. Now, this went ahead, as you would expect, with dramatic land use changes over the last 30, 40 years. And these land use changes led to a significant loss in biomass. And last but not least, looking at the temperature data, we observed a, a 0.05 degrees Celsius annual increase in temperature in Kiambu, or roughly four degrees Celsius from 29 to 2007. And all these factors evidently are very much intertwined and substantially influence the coffee production in this area. Now, if you want, there was one very interesting environmental footnote, or coming back to Pat Smyers, an, an insulating layer. Because what we observed is that the production types that were really hammered by these changes were not so much the small plantation, but the big ones, where coffee is grown as a huge monocrop without shade trees. Whereas more coffee gardens, as you see here, were much less affected. And this is probably due to the fact that when coffee is grown under shade trees, the, the microclimatic conditions in the plantations are pretty much different. Simply the temperature drops, the, the, the plantations are cooler. So, coming to the end of my talk, um, what are my take-home messages? 
Um, there are three. First of all, um, I hope you've seen that these cascading effects of the actually not so little enemies of higher trophic level have probably the greatest potential to cause harm as a result of global environmental change. I think that simplistically temperature only driven models often fail to capture these GEC outcomes. Other factors can entirely change the picture both positively as well as negatively and adding a significant element of complexity to the picture. And I think if you want to capture this complexity, interdisciplinarity is a prerequisite. And I hope that these three case studies have illustrated that you cannot achieve this uh, without an interdisciplinary uh, approach. And last but not least, uh, acknowledgements to my colleagues at ISIFA, um, colleagues from the Kenya Meteorological uh, Department. Um, the COFFEE study was funded by um, the German Research Foundation. Um, we did a lot of research on, on the Mbumi uh, Coffee Millers Plantation. Leibniz University of Hanover was a, uh, a trusted partner in the coffee research. Kenya Medical Research Institute colleagues participated in the malaria studies that were funded by the foundation from Switzerland. And we collaborated with colleagues in the US, the universities of Miami and Illinois. And with this, I would like to thank you very much. I think I express also your sentiments that uh, we are truly grateful for this exciting talk and uh, uh, further raising our expectations what you are up to, Christian, in the next, uh, uh, in the next uh, few years and decades. Uh, thank you very much. I'm sure you all want to debate him now and ask him questions and so on. You're welcome to do so outside during the reception. <laughs> Thank you very much for, for coming and uh, for uh, paying closely attention. I think uh, we all were very captivated by your talk, Christian, and uh, thanks again. Uh, please move on.